thank you very much for this warm welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hans, and thank you very much, Gülchen, for this invitation. I enjoy very much uh, being part of this conference every time I'm here. And uh, uh, today I'm addressing again a monetary uh, subject. The title of my lecture is The Ethics uh, of Capital Incomes. When I got married, uh, I, I warned my wife and I said, look, uh, uh, I'm interested in monetary economics. I will talk a lot about money. Doesn't mean that we will ever have much. <laughs> I will proceed in uh, six steps. First, I will spend uh, one minute or so on definitions. Then I'll explain why we should be interested in the ethics of capital incomes. Uh, then I'll explain or present the article, uh, the uh, arguments that Aristotle uh, mm -hmm. has presented on the, on the subject. Uh, in the fourth step, I will briefly revise uh, Thomas Aquinas' uh, doctrine. In the fifth step, I will present a critique of these arguments and I will conclude in the sixth point. So, let's start with a few definitions. Uh, capital is that part of our wealth that we use to earn income. Uh, that is a future uh, money stream. A house that we rent to other people is part of our capital. A house that we use ourselves is part of our wealth, but not part of our capital. Uh, work that is uh, money that we uh, spend on people working for our household uh, is part of, uh, of our wealth that we uh, spend on, on those assistants. Uh, people that we employ in our firm, which allows us to help earn future revenues, that money is spent is, is part of our capital. Uh, the ethics uh, is uh, that uh, theory that helps us to distinguish, or is the, the, uh, the ensemble of uh, distinctions that allow us to distinguish between good and bad, a good practice and right pra practice, and which uh, leads me immediately to um, the, the second point, so why should we care about the ethics of capital incomes? Well, I mean, every rational uh, person should do this, right? Every personal, rational person should be interested in distinguishing between what is right and what is wrong, um, because that's the only way to lead a happy life, right? So this is already very uh, Aristotelian. And probably also we find uh, similar thoughts, uh, analogous thoughts in Chinese philosophy and, and other uh, philosophies, right? So the ultimate objective of human life is to lead a happy life, a happy and fulfilled life. A happy and a fulfilled life doesn't mean, uh, of course, a life in which we s yield to every uh, sudden urge, uh, uh, we, we just let go and, and so on. This is not a happy life. A happy life is one in which we rationally uh, deliberate between what is uh, both in the short run and the long run uh, propitious for our well-being. So it's an interest uh, that we uh, should find as rational beings. It's uh, uh, something, uh, as far as capital incomes are concerned, it's, it's a, a very long subject because um, in, uh, it has been felt from antiquity, uh, at least onward, that at least some incomes uh, cannot be rationally justified, so are therefore illegitimate. And so we have uh, then the, the task of distinguishing uh, legitimate capital incomes, morally valid uh, capital incomes, and morally illicit capital incomes. Now, as you might imagine, this is a very vast subject, and I have 25 minutes left, so I will focus on some of the most widespread or most important arguments that have played a role in, uh, in history. Uh, for a very long time, uh, the Catholic Church has condemned all sorts of capital incomes. Uh, this was the canonical, it's known as the canonical interdiction of usury, right? And I will explain the uh, etymological origin of the word usury uh, a little later on. Uh, so the idea is that capital incomes per se are illegitimate and can be justified only for uh, secondary uh, uh, considerations, uh, which have been called ex extrinsic uh, considerations, right? For, for intrinsic uh, considerations, so essentially uh, capital incomes are unjust, but for extrinsic reasons, that is, that do not belong to the nature of capital income, they might be justified under certain uh, circumstances. So this doctrine you find expressed in the ca uh, uh, Codex Juris Canonici until the 1917 edition. In the 20th century, there were two editions, the one of 1917 and the other one then of 1983. In the 1983 edition, this century-old disposition had disappeared without commentary. Okay, so it's very interesting. Now, one of my points will be that 
uh, indeed, in order to distinguish um, legitimate from illegitimate capital incomes, we cannot trust only our intuition. If we do this, we almost invariably end up with wrong conclusions. And one of the problems of the traditional doctrine is indeed that it has some elements of truth, but is founded in um, uh, incorrect economic theory, as I will uh, demonstrate concerning two examples, most notably. So in order to come up with a pertinent ethics of capital income, we need most of all, and especially and fundamentally, to have a sound economic theory, which allows us to distinguish between what is good and what is not good. So let's talk then about Aristotle and Aquinas. So what are the reasons that we find in Aristotle against capital incomes? Because Aristotle indeed condemned capital incomes in all of their, their, their forms. Uh, Aristotle gives us four arguments, and I will first present them and then extend this by presenting very briefly Aquinas' doctrine and then proceed to a critique. The first argument that Aristotle gives us is that money uh, is not wealth in the sense that it cannot be consumed. It does not contribute to our well-being. We cannot eat money, we cannot sleep in money, and we cannot uh, cloth ourselves with money. Therefore, because it's not real wealth, it does not deserve to be remunerated. The second argument is that uh, money is an arbitrary institution. Uh, let me mention here right away something that is very important and will be important for the further uh, development of my argument, namely that the Greeks, uh, contrary to what uh, many people today imagine, already had fiat money. Okay? The Greeks, of course, did not have paper fiat money. Right? They didn't have dollar bills, they didn't have euro bills, and so on. Uh, so these were invented first by the Chinese. Well, not the, the dollar bills, but right, pa paper bills. But the Greeks had fiat money, and probably the previous civilizations, uh, of which we know much less than we know about the Greeks, probably they had fiat money as well. It's just something that is too convenient for governments, as most of these people of, of, of you uh, know. Right? There's something, uh, fiat money uh, is uh, an immaterial, it's a dematerialized uh, form of money uh, that can be produced at very low cost relative to its uh, exchange value. Right, and which therefore would not normally be used or naturally be used by market participants, but needs to be imposed on the market participants so that they accept and, and, and use it. So what kind of fiat money did the Greeks have? Well, they had uh, fiat money coins, right? They had token coins that they imposed at the place of uh, gold and silver coins. Right? The most important example is uh, the uh, fiat coin circulation created within the uh, Athenian, uh, the Attic uh, uh, League, right, which was created by, by uh, the, the city of Athens and imposed on its satellite uh, island states. So our, our Aristotle tells us that since money is completely arbitrary, we can, if we can impose fiat money, as he knew from personal experience, uh, well, we can s s replace it from one day to another with, with a different one. So if this is completely arbitrary, then, well, I mean, something that just springs from our mere uh, say-so cannot possibly have any intrinsic value, therefore does not deserve re remuneration. Right? Can be taken away from one day to another, doesn't have any value, therefore remuneration of money in the form of uh, uh, usury is not legitimate. The third argument, now it gets interesting, I think that philosophically this argument is uh, uh, very important, much more important than the two previous ones, is the following. According to Aristotle, money incomes or ca capital incomes are not limited, they're intrinsically unlimited. So in modern economic jargon we would say that uh, capital incomes uh, are always embedded in a disequilibrium framework. Uh, we never tend to a final equilibrium somewhere. There's never a stopping point somewhere. They tend just to heap on one uh, the other. So it's, it's an unlimited cumulative uh, process that makes people ever richer until the richest finally concentrate all the wealth in the country in their own pockets and everybody else is uh, starved. Right. 
So therefore, it is an in intrinsically disruptive uh, uh, form, a socially disruptive form of income should not be tolerated. This is a very interesting uh, argument. And the fourth argument uh, is that usually, if we just look at uh, exchange per, uh, per C as a form of exchange, is unjust because we give more than we, what we have received. A person who receives uh, a loan, right, you get a hundred dollar loan, and we have to pay back a hundred and five, right? He gives back more than what he has received. And so he, uh, therefore, he pays back not only the principal sum that he has uh, obtained, and which he, uh, and, and money is, uh, is, is a fungible good, so the only way to use it is to, to, to spend it. It's very much like a consumer good. Somebody loans you, uh, lends you a, a bread, right? So what you do is to eat the bread, and the next day then you restitute another bread. Uh, so with money, it's the same thing, right? The way to use it is to spend it, so you, you, you forego it. So what you do in the exchange is to restitute the same value. Uh, if we, you pay any extra on this, you, you sort of say pay extra for using it, but it's implied in the loan because it's a fungible good that can only be used in such a way, uh, maybe by, by spending it, so it's, it's already implied in the loan. Uh, by paying an interest on it, you pay twice, right? You restitute the value that you have received plus uh, you pay for, uh, for uh, the use of it, which would be double counting, according to Aristotle. Uh, therefore, the, the origin of the, uh, the word usury, right? it's, it's the, the payment that is received for using the good, and this payment would be legitimate because we already restitute the good uh, at the end of the, of the law. Now, Aristotle um, embedded this last argument in uh, theory of just exchange. So Aristotle starts from the notion that any uh, human f flourishing is possible only within the community. This resonates very much even with economists today because we know of the benefits of the division of labor. Um, Aristotle knew these benefits as well because he had read Plato. Plato is the, the father of the theory of the division of labor. He explains why people associate, right, because they derive personal benefits from working together and specializing in different uh, traits. <coughs> So people need to flourish individually, they need to associate. But association is not possible without justice. It's a very powerful and pertinent observation, I think. So, and then he asks the question, so what's the, what is just? What's the nature of justice? And Aristotle answers, well, the nature of being just means to be in equality with something. So the nature of a just exchange is that the two objects that are being exchanged have are equal. But what does it mean that if I sell a remote control, let's say for $20, what does it mean that the remote control is equal to the dollar bill? That doesn't make sense. Physically, it makes no sense. Right. So an aerosol says, well, um, uh, actually the remote control is not exchanged because the dollar bill is exchanged, let's say it's the glass or something like this. Uh, so the two objects are different, but um, well, they, they are, he says they are incommensurate, right? They, are, they cannot be reduced to the same denominator. We cannot say whether this is more than this, makes no sense. But it's monetary exchange that makes them comparable. Okay. Then, of course, he uh, will have received the objection, well, that money itself is also a good, so money itself uh, does not have the same value all of the time. It fluctuates in value. And he somewhat uh, coyly uh, uh, remarks, well, but money preserves its value better than all other goods. Okay, so that's his argument. This theory of just exchange then has been generalized by St. Thomas Aquinas in the, in the 13th century, so Aristotle, 5th, uh, 4th uh, century uh, before Christ, Ari uh, Thomas Aquinas, 13th century after Christ. And uh, Aquinas uh, builds the theory of a just exchange into a systematic uh, framework to deal with all actions uh, related to uh, market exchange. And just as Aristotle con condemns usury, having in mind probably just the uh, loan contract, Aquinas condemns usury in all of its forms. Most notably, profits earned by companies are usurious because a company, well, buys factors of production, then sells the products. If it sells the products at higher prices, then the
the value that is based for the factors of production? Well, it's actually robbing the uh, customers. Okay. Uh, similarly, fraud, what, what we do in fraud is to give something in exchange for a higher value as the thing that we give does not have the high value, right? We, we buy, uh, we sell a Dior puff, a perfume, we went through Istanbul and my, my wife said, oh, this is all fake, this is fake, this is fake, otherwise <laughs> these prices would not be possible. I said, no, I mean, the Turks are great entrepreneurs, they found ways of selling you a Dior a handbag for 10 uh, euros or so. I said, ah. So she knew better, of course. I, I'm, I'm too naive in these things, right? So, so, uh, and so it's, it's, it's fraud, right? They present uh, uh, a product as being something that it is not, right? Uh, so for Aquinas, right, the, the problem here is that with the, the value of the two objects exchange is not the same. Um, that's the definition of, uh, of fraud. And of course, it holds also true for uh, the loan contract with the same argument as uh, Aquinas, as, as Aristotle, right? The two uh, payments that are made do not have the same uh, value. Uh, and Aquinas then also delivers, delivers the uh, theory or the distinction between intrinsic reasons and extrinsic reasons, right? For intrinsic reasons, usury is always uh, to be condemned, but for extrinsic reasons, it can be allowed. For example, if we loan money or if an entrepreneur invests by paying salaries, by buying factors of production. He sells the product at higher prices. It can be legitimate because the entrepreneur incurs risk. Right? So the profit then can be interpreted as a risk premium. So that would be legitimate. Right? Also, if you lend money and the, the money that you lend to a friend or to some other person, you could have used it yourself. You could have invested it in, in your own firm so there's an opportunity cost going with this. This also is an extrinsic uh, justification for the uh, capital income that you derive from the loan. Okay. So far, so good. Now, let's proceed to a critique of these four arguments. The first one is, of course, very easy, right? The, the argument that money cannot be consumed, you cannot cloth yourself with money, you cannot uh, eat money, and so on. Well, okay. Uh, that, that's correct, but of course, that would imply that all other goods that are not consumer goods also have no value. Right? Factory buildings uh, would have no, machines of any sort would have no value, right? Uh, remote controls would have no value because I cannot eat the remote control, I cannot sleep with it, and so on, right? So this is a very weak argument. Right? It's, it's clear that all sorts of factors of production do have value and uh, deserve to be remunerated. The second argument uh, is similarly weak. Money is an arbitrary institution. Uh, the first point that, of course, we should uh, make as, as Austrians is that not all monies are arbitrary institutions, right? There's such a thing as natural monies that emerge spontaneously on the market, and they're not instituted by the arbitrary will of any single person. They are selected because people uh, uh, recognize in them objective physical qualities that make them particularly suitable as medium of, ex as media of exchange. Right? Like they're divisible, they're malleable, uh, they're homogenous, they're easily recognizable, they're scarce, they have a high purchasing power per unit of wealth, uh, per, per unit of volume, per unit of uh, weight, right? all these things. Uh, so these, these goods that exist, and they're not arbitrary, so what you remunerate is the package Right, of those objective physical qualities that make for a good medium of exchange. There's nothing arbitrary there. The other two arguments deserve a little bit more attention. And they are, as I said, they are more interesting philosophically. Let's take maybe the fourth argument f uh, first. Right, the fourth argument is, uh, so it revolves around the notion of uh, just exchange. The error in Aristotle's argument starts as soon as he defines the nature of justice in uh, equality. Right? The argument until then is entirely correct. Right? Human flourishing right, is the objective of any rational uh, human being. That's correct. Human flourishing is greatly promoted by <coughs> inclusion in a social context, in a family context, uh, uh, friendship, uh, the division of labor, commercial activity, and so on. That's also correct. And all these social 
relations need justice. If they are unjust, people ha do not have an incentive to remain within the social context, but have an incentive to leave the social context, become pirates, right, or robbers, or uh, whatever, right, to uh, just help themselves at the expense of others. So we need justice as a foundation of any social relationship. The arrow starts as soon as Arizal defines well, the just exchange as being an exchange of equal values. Right? So here we have a problem because indeed uh, this is something that we learned by elementary economic theory, and certainly the, the one that comes down from Karl Menger, but also right, we find the same idea already in texts of the Middle Ages and then uh, Condillac in the 18th century also stressed the same point that in an exchange we never exchange objects of the same value. We always exchange economic goods that have different subjective or personal values for the people who are concerned. Okay. So if I go to the bakery and buy my bread for a dollar, then the dollar has a higher value for the baker than his bread, therefore he gives me the bread in exchange for the dollar, and the bread has a higher value for me than the dollar, therefore I give the dollar very happily in exchange for the bread. Right. Now, and that, of, of course, and also implies that we should not conceive of the uh, the, the, the benefits, the gain of an exchange in purely materialistic terms. And we cannot say, well, I get uh, uh, this wonderful bread, and it smells good, and it nourishes me, and uh, I just give this shabby uh, piece of paper in exchange or something like this. I rob the baker, something like this. This is ridiculous, right? And the same thing also holds true if you uh, say, well, I lend 100 uh, units of money, $100 now, and will be paid 105 next year. And it's, it's a reasoning, you say, well, I get paid back more than I gave. This is a reasoning in purely materialistic terms because I compare just physical units. But the basic point of this uh, exchange is that I give 100 units of money now, whereas I will receive 105 in the future. The 105 in the future are different goods from the 100 now. Right. So f physically, right, the one is, is a higher quantity than uh, the, 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 the sum that I lend now, but in economic terms, it might very well be that 105 in the future are more important for this person who promised me to pay back 105 than, or are less important than the 100 now. So there is no injustice involved, and an exchange of this sort which then creates capital incomes is not, not illegitimate, unjust, or whatever we want to call it. It's perfectly legitimate uh, part of uh, uh, exchange that increases uh, welfare for all parties that are concerned. And so this is a basic error in interpretation of what's going on in an economic exchange. Now, uh, as far as the third argument con is concerned, uh, this is very interesting. Right, so the argument that monetary revenues are inherently cu uh, cumulative, right? so there, there's no stopping point involved. Right? So it's, uh, they, once we allow them, we allow that one part of society, an increasingly small part of society, rips off all others. Now, this argument, um, you might address it on purely empirical grounds, and this would draw us into discussions without any end, especially in our present context. So let me propose a, a theoretical distinction. We need fundamentally, and this is something that we learn from Mises in particular, but also from the classical economists, we need to distinguish between the operation of a free market society based on the respect of private property rights. On the one hand, and the operation of a market, market economy as it is hampered through monetary interventionisms, on the other hand. And in the case of a free market economy, without government interventions, I, uh, Aristotle's argument does not hold. It's simply not true in such a case that there is a, the, uh, the capital incomes are unlimited and do not tend toward some equilibrium value. It's, it's, it's not true uh, because uh, as uh, capital increases, right, capital becomes less scarce relative to the demand for, uh, for capital, and as a consequence, the remuneration of capital tends to decline, so it becomes ever lower rather than bigger, uh, and tends to decline towards some equilibrium value. And the higher is the, the capital accumulation, the lower tends to be capital incomes. And as a consequence, uh, then offer also, uh, not only capital incomes are limited, but they tend to discourage themselves, because the more you accumulate capital, the lower is the remuneration, so the less incentive you have to use additional wealth to earn additional revenue. 
Right? You have an incentive then to use that wealth for non-commercial uh, purposes, right? To fund a club, uh, uh, do caritative work, uh, and so on. Now, things are very different in the context uh, of an economy hampered by monetary interventionism, in particular in the form that is very familiar to us today, namely fractional reserve banking and fiat money. As soon as you have fractional reserve banking, there is a source of, of uh, revenue that is, in principle, unlimited. Right? As long as the money users have confidence in the ability of the banker to redeem the bank money that he issues, whatever, bank notes or uh, uh, accounting money or, and so on, the amount that he can issue is, in principle, unlimited. Okay, first point. Then, if we take account of the fact that this money is usually issue that is brought into circulation by credit, right, then the practice of fractional reserve banking allows to leverage investments. And leveraging investments means that the return on equity, that is the return on your, on your own money, is increased by uh, uh, using money that you receive at a, lower, uh, uh, at a low interest rate from the banker. So in such an uh, institutional setting, then, the revenues uh, on, on, on capital are, in principle, unlimited. Right? It depends on various extrinsic uh, factors where there might be a limitation. For example, banks might not fully cooperate. Uh, people might not have a full confidence in, in the banks and so on. Uh, but the activity per se tends toward revenues that are, in principle, unlimited. There's no stopping point. And a similar mechanism you have as soon as fractional reserve banking entails uh, a tendency, because it inflates the money supply, entails a tendency for the price level to increase. And as the price level increases, another thing happens, namely that uh, it becomes uh, more interesting to store your wealth in durable uh, goods, such as real estate, uh, or other well, well, cars, uh, and so on, uh, rather than in the form of money. If you keep your wealth in cash, that is, your, if you hoard money, you are sure to lose in an economy in which uh, the purchasing power of money uh, declines, right, because the price level increases. So you stop hoarding and you buy uh, real estate, not because you need more houses or you need uh, additional prairies for your cows and so on, but just because it's a suitable uh, way for you to store wealth. And you do the same thing also with financial assets, right? So you buy shares in companies not because you need more capital income, but because uh, simply uh, this is uh, suitable because uh, uh, shares in, in companies tend to increase with the price level, uh, whereas uh, the purchasing power of money declines. Right. So this creates a tendency for um, wealth goods, su such as shares, such as real estate, to increase relative to incomes. And thereby creates a redistribution process in favor of those who are already rich and to the detriment of those who are not yet rich. Okay. So in conclusion, then, we, we might say that Aristotle's argument is not absurd. And we have to uh, ask ourselves the question, why, how did Aristotle come upon this idea that capital incomes are, in principle, unlimited and therefore unreasonable? Well, I guess it's because he observed it empirically himself. And indeed, if you look at monetary history, economic <laughs> history, and that's what I've done, <laughs> you find indeed that there was a flourishing banking industry in 5th century Athens. And these banks did not only provide consumer loans, they essentially uh, specialized in financing businesses. So what Aristotle observed firsthand was the operation, was the functioning of a fiat money, fractional reserve, monetary system, which led him to the assessment, to the moral assessment of what he observed. And the moral assessment is correct as far as an interventionist monetary system is concerned, but it's wrong to generalize it to uh, the operation of a market economy as a whole. So in conclusion then, we might, uh, again, stress the necessity of an ethics of capital income and also the necessity of having a suitable foundation for such an ethics of capital income in an, a realistic economic theory. And a realistic economic theory leads us to the conclusion that capital incomes in a free market economy are 
beneficial uh, and therefore uh, not only morally justified as far as the individual uh, persons are concerned that are contracting, but also as far from the uh, larger point of view of, of society. Whereas government interventionism leads to the sort of problems that uh, theologians, philosophers, and also economists have discussed for centuries in appropriate terms, uh, generalizing a case that only holds true for government interventionism for the economy as a whole. Thank you for your attention.